we're doing a, a long series on nutrition and, and, and making that a big part of the 12 part Let's Cook Raw presentations. I mean, it's, it's half of the whole program is just nutrition. And, and, and I don't think it's because nutrition is more important to be quite honest. I think it's because more people have more misconceptions, more people have more questions, more people are focused um, on nutrition. I mean, I've done, I've done thousands of as hundreds of thousands of people to raise their hand if they're worried about their nutrition. And almost everybody puts up their hand. And I make it clear, I'm not talking about worried like it's a, a psychosis, okay? Maybe if we could say healthfully concerned, but, but hands go up, you know, everybody's hands go up. And, and I think it's sort of funny because I'm lecturing to vegans and vegetarians and raw food vegans and, and really, these are the people that needn't be concerned about nutrition. They should have let this go a long time ago. The people eating at McDonald's should be worrying about nutrition. The people, your next door neighbors should be worried. Your friends and relatives should be worrying about their nutrition. But really, worrying isn't going to help them very much, is it? They're going to have to make some changes. And so they're worrying. It's kind of like walking through a tunnel. And, and you go, oh, don't worry, I see a light at the end of the tunnel. And then you hear the rumble and the roar and you realize that the light you see is the headlight of the locomotive engine that's coming down the tunnel right towards you. I mean, I have a friend who weighs 600 pounds. 600 pounds is a big man. He can no longer get out of bed. He can no longer walk and, and a, I met him through a, a, you know, a mutual friend and the mutual friend said to him, Ray, let Dr. Graham help you. He can turn your life around. And Ray said, oh, okay. I would like to have him help me. I'm, I need help. I mean, my diabetes is killing me. I'm going to start losing limbs soon. I can't get out of bed anymore. I have no energy. Daughter, my wounds are not healing. Um, you know, my my heart problems, my diabetes. I know I've got at least one or two cancers that are growing on me. And, and it's, let Dr. Graham help me. I, I would like that. And, and I talked to him and sent him sort of a, a format of what the program would be like, what would be involved. And he, he got back to me and we were talking on a call like this one. And, and he said, I'm not gonna do your program. I go, why? And he said, food is my only pleasure in life. This is a man with a six-year-old. And I'm going, food is your only pleasure in life? How can that possibly be? How sad can that possibly be? Um, I enjoy my food, but I eat my food so that I can go do the things that I find pleasurable in life. <laughs> you know, I enjoy my fitness training, but I do my fitness training so that I can be fit enough to appreciate and enjoy all the other things in life that I want to do, like taking a walk with friends um, or having the energy to help somebody move when they need to move house or whatever it is. So I really, I'm trying to drive home a point of not worrying about nutrition and certainly not worrying about nutrition in the way that we were trained to worry about nutrition. We were trained to worry about nutrition um, piece by piece. We were taught nutrition piece by piece. What I call nutrition by the nutrient. And, and really, you know, with several hundred thousand nutrients, worrying about each and every one of those nutrients is never going to work. It can't possibly work. Nobody, nobody can juggle hundreds of thousands of bits and pieces of information. We can look at three or five or seven, or you might be aware of 27. I don't know, somebody with a brilliant mind can keep track of a certain number of details, but, but hundreds of thousands of nutrients and their interactions with each other is an impossibility. 
Sure, I recognize full well that we know a lot. But every nutritionist knows and agrees that we don't know everything about nutrition. And most likely we never will know everything about nutrition. I think the important thing to learn about nutrition is that we don't need to know everything about nutrition. Make peace with the fact that you never will know everything about nutrition, but that your body is working perfectly for you and you don't need to know more than that. That if we just cover the basics, you're really going to be just fine. So what happens when we look at nutrition by the nutrient is we start thinking, I need this nutrient, I need that nutrient. This is good for me because it has this in it. And, and we, be, we gain a very myopic view. Um, I call it the blind man and the elephant syndrome where you just look at one part and you don't see the rest. And for me, when I, when I look at how other animals are fed, no one talks about the nutrient. They talk about the food. The only exception to this is for our human companion animals. So when, we, when we've domesticated animals, we've got them living in our house, in our bed, in our whatever, in our laps. Um, then when people sell us that dog food or that cat food or that fish food or that rabbit food, they start talking to us about what's in it and what are the nutrients. But really, if we talk about what does a whale eat, we don't talk about the micronutrients. We just say, okay, a whale eats this or a whale eats that. And you talk about a tiger or a deer or a, you know, a rabbit, it really doesn't matter. We don't say, oh, the rabbit eats the grass because the grass has a lot of chlorophyll and the chlorophyll is important for the rabbit because it does this and that. And it, no, we just say rabbits eat grass, let it go. You know, or rabbits like to eat the leaves of clover or whatever it is, I don't know. Um, we look at the foods they eat knowing full well that if they eat the appropriate foods, they will obtain the appropriate nutrients. And we can be fully confident in this exact same concept that when we eat the foods that are appropriate for us, fruits and vegetables, sweet and juicy, uh, botanical fruits, if you will, and some greens, if you like them. Um, we've covered our bases and we don't have to go further in order to make sure that we get enough of this, that, or the next. So I was listening to a very interesting article, uh, listening to an interesting presentation a couple of days ago by a, a fairly knowledgeable doctor. I mean, the guy, the guy is an expert in his field and, and his field is uh, communicative diseases and, and he, he knows microbiology and he was Dr. Graham, we cannot hear you. Am I the only one? No, no, you're not the only one. I, he froze up on me too. Yeah, yeah he seems frozen. Okay, cool. one second, I'll uh, test him. He had power problem earlier. Yeah. Okay, he'll re-log. Okay. That was interesting, huh? That, that was, was an interesting concept. Yeah, I'm taking, I'm taking notes here. So the notes that I jotted down, it was we don't need to know everything about nutrition, nor no, we don't know everything about nutrition, nor do we need to know. And if we eat the appropriate foods, we will get the appropriate nutrients. So um, who here has 
a, heard a copy of Dr. Graham's lecture called Perfect Health. Anybody? Larissa, Sarah? I do have, love it. Love it. That's, that's awesome. I have it on uh, so you, you've heard it, Feather? Oh, okay. How about Sarah? Did you raise your hand, Sarah? Oh, okay. No, I haven't heard it. How do we uh, watch it? Do we buy um, it? Or? Yeah, it's, it's available for sale. So it's a, it's a very long interview. It's something like a, a series of 12 lectures by mm -hmm. Dr. Graham and Frederick Patinode. Um, and it's called the Perfect Health Series. It's really good. It's really good. It's really yes. good. It's, it's, I highly recommend it to anybody. It's my favorite um, series of lectures right now. And I, I have yes. listened to it over and over again. Oh, are you back, Dr. Graham? There we go. Hey, yeah, I just thought I'd come back for a visit. <laughs> we Welcome just, back. We were I'm just sorry. Talking. I'm in Costa Rica. I'm in the land of, of power outages. Oh, nice. We were just talking about your lecture series, Perfect uh, Health, and the question yes. came up, uh, where can someone purchase the Perfect Health series if they wanted to? Oh, yeah, that's right on my website. I just go to my oh. website store. To the store, okay. Yeah, they can just go to the website store and food and sports store. And so Feather has, Feather has heard it, Sarah's heard it, Larissa's heard No, Sarah's not heard it, Larissa's heard it, and uh, you got some great reviews. I've heard it. Yeah. I actually own it. I bought it. So I, I bought it when I was. Thank you very much. That's very kind. Yeah, I've got all your CDs. I bought them all. <laughs> yeah, I did the same feather when I was in Costa Rica. Yeah, I bought the lot. <laughs> and I've added to the collection. I'll just have to make more. <laughs> yes, please. If you've got them all, I'll just have to make more. I'm actually in the process of making a bunch right now. I've got a, um, I've got a program of about 600 short lessons that I'm going to turn into an audio presentation. And, and, and like I say, they are short lessons. And so most of them are, are in the five minute range or less, but it's 600 of them nonetheless. And I figure, I figure that should be fun too. And everybody should own per perpetual health. If you don't have it, it's like having Doug as oh, a every single day. I read it every morning, Doug. Perpetual Health, 360. How much fun is that? Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, I'm in the process. Yeah, I want to finish that one so that I can get on to the next one because I just started one that's a thousand lessons and, and that's going to be so much fun. Um, a lesson a day should keep you going for a few years. So we'll just keep going. Let me see if I can uh, regain my momentum here. Uh, we, were, we were talking about about nutrition by the nutrient and really not worrying about it so much that if we can get people eating the appropriate foods that they're going to find over and over and over that we don't need to evaluate our zinc level or our whatever level it might be, uh, that we don't need to worry about the nutrients for which there are no tests, that and I'm still being told when my internet is unstable, I'm sorry. Um, we don't need to basically worry about nutrition. Um, when I was a kid growing up, we learned about nutrition. And what we, what we learned was that if you were out of range on certain nutrients, that there would be symptoms. You know, if your vitamin A got too high, your palms would turn yellow or orange or something and if you were if your vitamin d got too high uh there were signs in the eyes and there were some other signs so you could tell that vitamin d levels had gotten too high and if you were uh, high or too low and various other things you know you would invariably show symptoms at which point you would need to do something about it but to do something about it in advance of having a problem isn't a smart health move. You don't, I mean, we're looking at people who are trying to prevent breast cancer by having their breasts removed before they have cancer. Um, you know, this isn't, you might as well have everything removed. Let's, you know, 
Oh, we won't go there. <laughs> so let's just have everything removed. So for me, I'm, I'm going through this nutrition by the nutrient concept and going, no, really, we don't need to go there at all. We don't need to try to juggle things that we couldn't. Nobody could throw 100,000 cards in the air and then catch them on the way down. Could you imagine, right? You can't juggle that kind of nutrition. It's already been done for us by eating the foods that are appropriate for us. And so in many ways, being a nutritionist is, is kind of like trying to reinvent the wheel. Why would you want to do that? It, it's already been done, figured out, put into perfect order and allowed human beings to survive through many millennia, um, millions of years even. And, and we don't need to now figure it out nutrient by nutrient. There are way more important things to do in life. So I would rather just say, how much of the food on your plate is fresh food? You know, if it's, if it's whole, whole fresh, ripe, organic plants, which are topics we'll cover, you know, why is fresh so important? Well, we know fresh is important because fresh has a higher level of specific qualities. I'll call them nutrients if you want, but higher level of specific qualities that make the food better for you. We have things that are a whole class of nutrients known as antioxidants. Um, we have a class of foods known as phytonutrients. Um, many of the things that are in fresh food are susceptible to exposure to air. When we see it happen, you cut an apple and it browns and nobody really wants to eat the brown. Inherently, we know we don't really want to eat the brown. Um, and so you take the thinnest slice you possibly can and slice that off the apple and inside there, it's all white again. Oh, how good. So, but we have that, that natural inclination to understand that, okay, the brown isn't going to hurt you all that much. But we know that the fresh is better. And if it isn't fresh for a lot of things, it just gets old. But for a tremendous number of foods, if it isn't fresh, it spoils. It goes bad. If anybody's ever taken a bite of, of a tomato that went bad, or sprouts that went bad, or avocado that went bad, or probably just about anything else that wasn't fresh anymore and it had gone off, and you go, oh my, oh, never again. Oh, you know, and we can use our sense of smell to recognize this and our sense of vision to recognize this, and sometimes even sense of touch to recognize that things are no longer fresh. Uh, but it has, it has been proven to us time and time again through hundreds of years that fresh food is best for us. Uh, again, these are nutrition facts that we do not have to reinvent. We don't have to learn them again. Um, we can go to almost any grocery store and somewhere in their motto, they're talking about fresh is best or fresh foods or uh, it's pretty amazing how, how and then you got to go, well, okay, so what's fresh? I mean, if it's bottled, boxed, bagged or canned, is it fresh? Well, probably not. Was it ever fresh? Well, yeah, but you can't say it's still fresh. Um, it's been preserved in some way. And if it's been preserved in some way, then it's got in it preservatives and and preservatives work against our health i mean it, in a very simple fashion what preservatives do primarily is prevent microbes from attacking your food but that antimicrobial function 
works on us too. And we need our microbes. We don't want to be consuming those antimicrobial factors, whether that be sugar or salt or any of the other things that are used as BHA or, or other things used as preservatives, uh, because those things are by nature, by design, by definition, these are anti-life factors. They stop life from happening. They don't, I mean, it, it's not like, oh, let me eat the most preservatives I can because it'll help preserve my health. No, it doesn't work that way. They're not preservatives to life. They are preservatives because they stop life from happening. They prevent all of the microbial um, and eventually when we're exposed to it, the bigger creatures from surviving. So yeah, you can put salt on something and it'll function as a preservative, but if you put um, an ounce or two of salt on you, if you consume an ounce or two of salt, it will kill you, it won't preserve you, it will actually kill you. So for me, I emphasize fresh food as being super important because, how do I say it? Not be because fresh foods are so important, but because everything else is a compromise I don't wish to make. It's a compromise in my own health that I don't wish to make. Will I ever eat anything that isn't fresh? Sure. I make lots of compromises in my life. I flew on an airplane to get to where I am now so I could have power outages. No, because it's a beautiful place. But I mean, I flew on an airplane and, and trust me, 14 hours on one airplane is a long flight and you know it takes a toll, but it's a price I'm willing to pay. And, and there are many things like that. I'll drive in a plane, drive in a car or a train or, or you know, um, I'm, I'm going to Bucharest uh, this summer and giving some lectures in Bucharest. And, and it's not the world's cleanest city. It's not the world's dirtiest city by all means, but it's certainly not, it's still a city. And when you're living in a city, invariably you're breathing city air. And city air is always a compromise. I don't care what city it is. City air is a compromise and I'm willing to make this compromise. So we look at things like this and, and go, okay, fresh is best. We understand intuitively, we understand scientifically why fresh is best. And does it mean you're only, and if you're only going to consume fresh foods with no exception, well, I don't know. You're going to choose where do you make your exceptions. But every time you increase the percentage of fresh food on your plate, you're doing something that's to your advantage. Every time you eat more fresh food, uh, every time you commit to eating fresh food before anything else that might be a part of your meal. Um, so you start the meal with fresh food. Every time this, this fresh food component increases you're doing yourself a benefit you're doing yourself a favor and when you know when i when i work with people who are tremendously ill we want to stack every lifestyle card in their favor we give them only fresh food when we work with athletes who want to perform at their very best again i want to stack every lifestyle card in their favor and i encourage them to eat to the greatest degree possible, exclusively fresh food, because it will yield the best results. And when it comes to most athletes, they go, you know what? I don't really care what I eat. I just want the best results. I'm willing to eat anything if that's gonna bring me the best results. So I encourage you to grab a hold of some of that motivation, uh, motivation that a person who's lost their health might have, or motivation that a that an athlete might have and say, I want some of their results. And if I want to get their results, all I really need to do is just do what they do and I'll get what they get. 
So that model works. Now, I tend to Okay, I guess we lost him again. Oh boy, okay. So uh, the question came up about, can raw vegan show a bit lower protein than the SAD population? The average range is for SAD eaters, not raw vegans. I think there should be a new average range done on raw vegans. I agree, 100%. Uh, in fact, if you were to eat the recommended daily al allowance by the FDA of protein, eventually you're going to have kidney failure. Uh, if you live long enough, the average RDA of protein is, is simply too high, uh, according to the FDA. Uh, so, and I think that's probably because of all the pressure on the meat and dairy industry on our leaders. You know, they have, um, they have people, you know, who basically are trying to influence public policy, uh, you know, in Washington, D.C., and create unrealistic or un unhealthy guidelines in order to sell their products. You know, it, you have to follow the money. So um, anybody else have any questions? Let's see. I think we had a question for Dr. Graham about uh, the RDA levels and blood tests. Uh, if they're lower than what doctors consider to be a healthy range. Um, I think I know what Dr. Graham would say. <laughs> Uh, anybody else have any ideas on that? Well, unmute yourself if you would like to chime in. Nah. Oh, he's back. Okay. <laughs> oh my. Well, you know, I've I've been I've been in this um, been in this condo for three days. This is the first time we're losing power, but it, they they must have known that this was the time. That's right. <laughs> I'm sorry. So I'm going to apologize as if it, I had any control over it whatsoever, but I'll apologize nonetheless. I'm, I'm, I don't like to give something that you might feel is disjointed. Fortunately, we were right at that point where I was about to express to you not, not so much why I'm in favor of raw foods, because I'm sure you've heard all that many, many times, but let's look at the other side of the coin. What might drive you away from cooked food? And, and um, I don't know if knowledge is enough to drive you away from cooked food. Cooked food has a tremendous lure on people. And we understand these are, this is an addictive lure. Um, people's, people have to discover how addictive it really is, right? Once they, once they try to move away from, from cooked and it's why we're working with our group of, of raw fooders committed for a year to help them get free of the hooks. And it's funny because, because um, there's a book called Hooked on Raw, which I think is, is, it was a brilliant title and I'm very glad for it. But at the same point, Hooked on Cooked is, is such a reality that people have a hard time saying no to cooked food. I mean, if you're in a grocery store and they're giving away free food, I mean, you might be a raw foodist, but I, I mean, I, I would be willing to bet that everybody has struggled at some time or another to walk past, you know, the free food and say, oh no, I won't even take a bite of that. Eventually that gets easier, but there are times where people struggle and, and hooked food has its I'm sorry, cooked food has its hooks in you really more than most people recognize. So sometimes for me, I, I, I live a lot of my life based on desired outcome. I, I look at things, maybe it's just because I'm a goal oriented person, I don't know, but I spend a lot of time doing things because I want a certain result more than you know, oh, this is just something I love so much. Like, like I want to be able to run. I want to be able to run quickly. I want to be able to run far. I want to be able to just run endlessly. Um, and so I go out and run every day. 
And yes, I enjoy my running. But if people to ask me, why do I run? I'm going to tell them it's because I want to be able to run when I'm 70 and I want to be able to run when I'm 80 and I want to be able to run into my senior years. And, and sometimes I say, well, somebody might ask me to play soccer with them. So I want to be ready, but nobody in my whole life, I'm 68. Nobody's ever asked me to play soccer with them. Not once. So I think the likelihood is going down at this point, but I want to be ready just in case somebody invites me to play. And and I have desired outcomes. You know, I, I want to be able to get out of a chair uh, when I'm a senior citizen. And I want to be able to, to help in the gardening and play with my grandkids. And I want to be able to do things. And so I stay fit because, yeah, I, I like my fitness activities. I love to play. But I stay fit because I have a desired outcome. And I see what happens to people who eat cooked food. And I see the outcome. And that is not an outcome I want. And so I look and I go, okay, so I'm eating raw food because there's a desired outcome. But I also did the science. I also did my homework. And, and the people who just interned with me down in Costa Rica know what I mean when I say do your homework. You go back and you find out. And I found out that cooked food has some problems. And their problem that we've known about for a hundred years. So I'm sorry today, I'm not going to give you any news. It's a hundred year old news. How much news could it possibly be a hundred years later? This is old. This isn't, this doesn't even count as news anymore. I can't even call it old news. It's just, it's old, old. It's a hundred years old. We've known for a hundred years that when you heat food, chemical changes happen. People have known longer than that, but the chemists started finding out what those changes were. And there was a guy named Dr. Maillard from France, and Dr. Maillard found out that, that when you heat food, you have two options. You can heat them in an open container or an open fire, however you want to, in the open, which means that they're exposed to oxygen when you heat them. Or you can heat them in a closed container where there is no free oxygen available. And in both cases, reactions happen. When it's done with oxygen available, like over an open fire, then these are called oxidative reactions. And when you dig a pit and put the fire down in the pit and then put some a bunch of palm leaves down on top of that. And then you put the food in on top of that. And then you cover it all up with more grass. And then you cover it all up with some more sand and you heat the food in the absence of oxygen. These are known as reductive, reductive reactions. And, and it turns out the potters in China knew about this 5,000 years ago. This isn't anything new. Oxidative and reductive reactions have been around for a long time. But it wasn't until Dr. Maillard came along that we started understanding the chemistry. And what he found out was that when you do this, either of the two ways and to the degree that the heating is done, uh, both the, the amount of time and the amount of temperature would affect the process of oxidation or the process of reduction and certain things happen. One of the things that happens, color changes. So when you heat food, it changes color. And this is why most cooked foods are brown. Because it is an often, the Maillard reactions are often referred to as browning reactions. And, and so things turn brown. They change color. Another thing that happens is that various what are called aromatic benzene rings, things that smell, uh, oils with a smell are produced or released from the food. And so we can smell cooked food. And, and it wasn't for another 20 or 30 years that scientists started doing their homework on what are these things we smell to discover that 
they are all carcinogenic smells. These are things we smell that are carcinogenic. They cause cancer, um, like the smoke from a like the smoke from tobacco, or the smoke from an open fire, or the smoke from food cooking on a grill. Uh, this smoke is carcinogenic, and it exerts a negative influence on our health. In fact, a tremendous number of the aromatic benzene rings, the, the smelly oils that come off of food, um, not only are they carcinogenic, but by the time you smell them, they've already gone up your nose, into your bloodstream, to your brain. Oh, let's go back up your nose, into your bloodstream. That's the critical point. They're now in your body. They're in your bloodstream. It's not like, oh, I really like the smell of, of donut shop. Every time I go past the donut shop, I never eat the donut, but I always just go, what a lovely smell. And then by the time you smell it, it's in your bloodstream. And that smell, the particulate matter, the, the heated oils, this is carcinogenic stuff. Now, it turns out that there's a bunch of different gens, gen being the origin of, and so carcinogen is the origin of cancer, but mutagen is the origin of mutation. Mutations amongst humans, uh, again, almost all cooked foods contain mutagens. Uh, mut mutagens in humans means that cells can no longer perfectly reproduce themselves. And when cells no longer perfectly reproduce themselves, uh, the way we understand this is essentially the aging process. So when we see the onset and the forwarding of the aging process, we see mutagens in action. Is it deadly in one dose? No, you're not gonna die from eating one cooked meal. Just like you're not gonna chop a tree down with one stroke of an ax, but every, every chop, right? Every stroke, every bite has a cumulative effect that's taking us in a direction that most likely you don't wanna go. And it's an interesting factor that we, that we have so much vitality in us that when we just stop the mutagenic food intake and replace it with raw food, we watch people regenerate, rejuvenate, and, and literally become younger, become young, younger feeling, become younger looking. Uh, you know, as the old expression goes, health happens if we let it. So we have carcinogens, we have mutagens. We have the teratogens, which are really quite fascinating stuff. Teratogens don't overtly negatively affect your health. When you consume teratogens, you don't really notice anything negative happening. What happens negative happens to your offspring or even theirs or theirs. It can be seven generations down the line. It can be a cumulative effect that really wasn't enough to negatively affect your children, but they've got those teratogens and then they consume those teratogens and then they pass on more of that teratogen. Um, this is, this is, Okay. We can have our intermediate discussion here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think we may have lost him again. Well, I'm sure he'll be back shortly. So I have uh, Dr. Maillard, the French doctor. I'm just kind of going over my notes here, determined that the smoke from cooked foods are carcinogenic, uh, which leads to cancer. Mutagens cause cells that can't reproduce themselves correctly. Uh, teratogens cause problems, not necessarily just in us, but in our offspring and perhaps for several generations uh, later. And that people regenerate on raw foods and become younger. That's the good news. <laughs> I love that's, that message. 
I also like what Dr. Graham had to say, and we'll just consider this maybe a little review about preservatives, which uh, are designed to prevent microbes from eating our food, but they do the same thing in us and we need our microbes. And uh, that salt is a preservative. And that's one of those things that uh, a lot of people in the raw food world still use, unfortunately. And uh, one ounce of salt is lethal. So that's about one rounded tablespoon. I've heard it said that uh, the average American eats about one fiftieth the lethal dose of salt every single day, uh, which is not good. I also like what Dr. Graham had to say about um, how athletes, professional athletes and really, really sick people. Uh, the first thing that he'll do is he'll put them on 100% fresh food. And uh, I think he made a good point about, you know, we really need to define what fresh means. And uh, that means that it's just picked from the earth or from the plant, not like the average apple. Um, I heard a TED talk the other day that the average apple on the supermarket shelf was picked nine months ago. Yeah. Yeah. They, the average broccoli was picked a month ago. So that's not really fresh, is it? <laughs> well, I guess fresh has to be a continuum, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> but on that continuum of fresh, we want as fresh as possible. So um, first of all, folks, let's give a big hand to Brian because he's he didn't know he was going to be presenting today. Three or four. <laughs> we don't even know yet how many times. And thank you for stepping in so quickly. Each time I I, I see myself disappear from the screen and I cringe and, and I go, oh, nothing like this is not me, folks. Trust me, I'm not doing this intentionally. Uh, so we're looking at we're looking at carcinogens mutagens, teratogens. And we start to go, oh, wow. And the scientists have proven to us that there's teratogens in all cooked foods. Like, it's not like, oh, I'm going to get away with it this time. I'm just going to eat a baked potato. No, nope, there's teratogens in there too. You can look on the internet. I'm not making this stuff up. I did my homework, but you can go double check me if you want, if you don't believe it. We see all kinds of tumors growing on people. And the thing that creates tumors in the body, the substances that create tumors in the body are known as tumorigens. And we know there's tumorigens in all cooked food. And then one of the things that's incredibly common amongst human beings is tremors. We see tremors. There's, there's all different kinds of tremors. And I've done a bit of homework on tremors because, you know, a fair number of clients come to me and they're very concerned because suddenly they're having tremors and they think right away they have Parkinson's because that's one of the kinds of tremors is the Parkinson's, it's called a pill rolling tremor. Parkinson's is a pill rolling tremor. This isn't a Parkinson's tremor. This is an intention tremor. So there's lots of different tremors and you don't need to know right now, but, um, the substances that we can be exposed to that result in us having tremors are known as tremorogens. And again, you want to find tremorogens? Look in any cooked foods. When we heat foods, we create substances known as tremorogens. And, and I mean, by the time you start looking at all those gens and go, I don't want any of them, there's got to be some point where you start thinking, I'm going to eat according to the outcome I desire. And Brian, I, I just want to get back to that because I'm glad that point meant something to you. Um, that when, when I'm working with sick people, we want to stack every card in their favor. When we're working with super performers, we want to stack every card in their favor. Because in fact, the only way they're going to perform better than their mates is if they take better care of themselves than their mates because they're all trained in the same and they all have the same equipment and they all have the same access to coaching tricks and tips. So it's going to really come down to how well they live, how fast they recover based on how, how they take care of themselves. But, uh, there is a third group 
And that third group is the people who are in the intensive care unit in the hospital. And I think that's just so fascinating that in the intensive care unit of the hospital is the only place in the hospital where they take exquisitely great care of you. And they really stack every card in your favor and they want you to hit a steady state. They put you on that drip, you know, and, and, they, and they don't want to shock you even with hospital. I mean, can you imagine giving you hospital food? By the time you're eating hospital food, you're about ready to get out of intensive care. And they're going to put you in the regular hospital. Um, but in intensive care, you're, you're typically on a drip. And they're just giving you that which you need, which is water, glucose, and saline. So it's a, a fascinating world that these people get exquisite care. They don't wake them up when they're sleeping. They let them sleep as much as they need. They make sure the temperature is comfortable. They do everything they possibly can to keep those people in intensive care stack every card in their favor. They're monitoring how much liquid goes in and how much liquid goes out. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty intense. And, and we, when we want to design an ultimate performance package for ourselves, need to look at what happens in intensive care and, and take as many of those advantages on for ourselves as we possibly can. So brings me back to where my presentation started, uh, which is a, for those of you who intend to do presentations, it's a style that I like to use where um, at the beginning of the presentation, I sort of tell you what I'm going to tell you, and then I tell you about it. And then at the end, I bring you back and tell you what we just told you. So I'm not, I'm doing that, but not exactly in that way. Uh, but where we started was, are you worried about nutrition and how worried about nutrition are you? And should you be worried about nutrition? And, and, and no, you shouldn't because you're eating raw foods or hopefully eating raw foods. And, and hopefully by the time I finish scaring the bejesus out of you today with all the stuff about cook food, then maybe you'll eat a little more raw food in your day. But the question was, how worried about nutrition are you? Should we be? And the answer is no, because raw foods, for the most part, contain no anti-nutrient substances. Now, an anti-nutrient is a substance that either blocks your ability to utilize a certain nutrient, or it interferes with your uptake of a nutrient, or it doesn't allow that nutrient to interact with some other critical nutrient, or it actually increases your need for a nutrient. So for instance, smoking a cigarette is an anti-nutrient for vitamin C. It increases your need for vitamin C. It drives vitamin C off your, oh, and vitamin B for that matter, uh, as does walking down a city street, by the way, increased need for vitamin C if you're walking down a city street. And if a bus goes by, then even more so. So um, anti-nutrients and, and fascinating, fascinating. There's, a, there's a, a food that's eaten in a lot of tropical environments known as taro. And, and it's, a, it's a starchy tuber and that particular starchy tuber is notoriously low, I wanna say in magnesium. I wanna say magnesium, not manganese, but it's been a long time since I looked it up. So gosh, if I'm telling you the wrong thing, Sarah, you wanna look that up and tell me whether it's magnesium or manganese. Um, and thanks for being there. <laughs> so, so the taro, the taro root, which you then boil or you let it ferment for a while, you, it, you know, you cook it down. It's like any other starch, like a potato, and and it's really low in manganese, magnesium. It's one of those two. And when you cook it, in order to prepare it, you create a substance in the taro that is an anti-nutrient for manganese. 
So not only does it not have as much manganese as everything else, and I know I've switched back and forth between magnesium and manganese, uh, not only does it not have as much, but it then also exposes you to the anti-nutrient that makes you need even more. Okay. Uh, sounds like we lost him again. I'm sure he'll be back shortly again. I like those reviews, Brian. <laughs> okay. They really kind of uh, stabilize in that information. There's so yeah. much going on and sometimes you're surprised, but here is something that is not really agreed with your um, acceptance and knowledge. So and your brain kind of for a second shuts it down. So reviews actually helps. Yes. Absolutely. And I want to say, I believe this is very, very valuable education that we're getting here today. I don't know where else you can go and get this kind of education. So Rachel has a question. She has her hand raised. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Just a quick question. The reviews are extremely helpful. Would it be possible to all the attendees be, be emailed your, your weekly notes? Your sure. Monthly? Yeah, I'm just thinking, I know, you know, it's just really good. I mean, I've made my own notes, but I think it's really nice to have as reminders. Yeah, uh, so I just, um, Larissa, could you send me a list yes. of uh, the attendees? I'll do that. Mm -hmm. And then what I'll do is I'll forward my notes to you. I, um, I'm taking notes as fast as I can, but I'm not sure I'm capturing all of Dr. Graham's thoughts. Uh, but, you know, I... You know, just to review carcinogens, mutagens, teratogens, um, and tremorigens uh, are the gens that uh, Dr. Graham talked about. Uh, and we covered some of that. Uh, the, um, he also mentioned uh, raw foods contain no anti-nutrients, uh, which are anti-nutrients are in all cooked foods and increase our need for nutrients when we eat foods containing anti-nutrients. And the example he used was smoking increases your need for vitamin C by 100 fold and uh, increases your need for vitamin B. And welcome back, Dr. Graham. We're just doing a review. <laughs> well, so um, thanks. My gosh, guys, you, you honor me today and thanks for bearing with me. Uh, I was, I was kind of like closing the door there on anti-nutrients and, and And I'm wondering how much, you know, how much relevance it, it, it gains. But I, there's an interesting story, right? These uh, people used to go out on boats. Explorers would go out on boats for a long time, and and because they were wind powered or, or rowing even, but you'd be out on the shipboard for a long time, and, and of course the you couldn't take a lot of a lot of food without fantastic amounts of preservatives, you couldn't take much fresh food. And so the, the food that you could take uh, maybe the most of was flour. And, and flour is a, you know, grain products typically have no vitamin C. Um, and here's these people living out on, the sailors living out on shipboard, uh, eating bread and pancakes and stuff. Um, and trying to live on it. And sailors, it, it seemed the same thing would just keep happening to sailors all the time. They'd start losing their teeth. They had really, you know, really bad teeth and they'd start losing teeth. And, and, and we learned that this was uh, due to a condition known as scurvy. Well, the British sailors figured out the solution. They were known to have figured out the solution. Everybody knows what the British sailors are called. Limeys. They're called limeys. And the reason was because they would take limes on board with them, or when they went to the um, more tropical countries, they would buy limes uh, that grew in the more tropical places. And they, would, they were told to eat the limes, whether they wanted to or not. They were told to eat the limes uh, because this would save their teeth. Well, um, I think about three years ago now, maybe probably probably three, um, some some sailors from Mexico, no fishermen, I'll get it right. Fishermen from Mexico were 
out to sea, pretty far out to sea, and a storm came and blew them off course and, and destroyed enough of the power of the boat so that they were now just drifting. And they drifted and drifted and drifted, and they had no food with them really particularly. Uh, and so they started eating some seaweed where they could and catching some fish where they could. And, and that was pretty much the end of their supplies. And they drifted for nine months. Well, most people will tell you that if, if you're out to sea, like the sailors used to go, if they would go more than a month, two months, um, they're losing, their, their oral health is in sad decay. And, and by six months, it's unlikely they're gonna have any teeth in their head. Uh, these guys were out on the ship for nine months before they were discovered by anybody. And when they were, they were just off the coast of Australia. So they were taken down to Australia and, and given a you know, full medical and surprised to find, hey, these guys don't have any scurvy at the end of nine months. Their teeth are just fine because they weren't eating grain products with all the anti-vitamin C uh, nutrients that we typically find in starchy food. So anti-nutrients along with all the different gens, the negative gens um, in, the, in the 19, I think around 1918, 1919, Dr. Mayard did his research. So I'm telling you, it's a hundred years ago, a full hundred years ago. 10 years later, Dr. Pottinger did his research with the cats and discovered that when he cooked, you know, when he gave the cats cooked food that their health declined, he didn't full well know why or how or what was going on, but the cats on raw food did just fine. Uh, in the in the 40s and into the 50s, we discovered that when we grill foods, the carcinogens are formed. Um, in in the 60s and into the 70s, we learned about teratogens and mutagens and and tremorogens and tumorogens. And we learned all this. This this is easily 50 and 60 year old science right into um, 2001 when the whole acrylamide thing was came to light, which is another carcinogen, but it came to light because it was news at the time. We didn't, hadn't really discovered the whole thing about acrylamide in cooked food. And, and so that made worldwide headlines. I happened to be traveling at the time and saw headlines in a couple of different countries um, as it went around the world that, that cooking starchy food uh, results in the generation of acrylamide, which is a class one carcinogen, meaning that it causes cancer. It's not just suspected of causing cancer, it causes cancer. And I figured like within a day or two, everyone in the world would give up eating starchy food, but no, didn't happen. We just go, oh, okay cancer causing, let's keep eating it, but I really like bread. You know? Okay, well, yeah, you really do, but it doesn't like you so much. And, and so if we're outcome oriented people, which I think we are, I think we're smart enough to be outcome oriented rather than just plodding along, doing whatever we're told, whenever we're told, wherever we're told, bend over, I have a vaccine for you, um, that we can look at the outcome we desire and go, okay, do I want to have all of those things in my food? No, I'm smart enough to know I don't want that. That's not the result I want. And if, if cooked food, um, sorry, I can't figure out how not to make that shadow happen. Larissa's got it perfect. I got this big shadow, sorry. You look good with the shadow, Dr. Graham. <laughs> I thought it was a halo. Yeah, that's maybe, right. maybe that's it. Maybe it's my aura. It's gray. Man. Yeah, there you go. I need to, I need to scrub my aura, man. Um, so, and I don't know what makes it happen. It's Your the, hair growing out. Yeah, <laughs> oh, oh, it's, 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 it's the background image. If you remove the, if you remove the background image, they will go away. But, yeah, but then, then I won't have a background. That's true. Yeah. 
<laughs> I have the same. I have the same problem. I think it might have to do with the bandwidth or something on my end. Ah, uh, maybe because I'm losing. Uh, I'm losing a lot pretty quickly, right? I do. I'm. I'm like haloed around. I'm like, <laughs> I am distractible, aren't I? Ever? I'm so distractible, folks. People say, "Oh, you must be so focused. You must be so much willpower." So I go, "No, no, no. I'm easily distracted." But I do like to focus on a goal. I do like to know what the outcome is. I like, man, can you imagine getting in your car and just driving and having no target whatsoever? No, like, oh, we're just driving. Yeah, I don't know where we're going. How often? I mean, in the last year, how many times have you gotten in a car and go, I'm just going to drive and I've got no destination and I'm not even going to keep track. So at the end. Uh oh. Uh oh. I think we lost him. <laughs> I must admit, I've done that when I was a teenager, but that was a long time ago. <laughs> okay, so uh, he talked about anti-nutrients and um, the flower story on the boats is very interesting. I never heard that before about the scurvy and the fact that uh, when these Mexican sailors were lost out of sea for nine months, they had no scurvy because they weren't eating flour products, which is uh, really interesting. And, and so he's pointing to the anti-nutrients in flour products as increasing our need for vitamin C, uh, most likely very dramatically. Dr. Mayard, and Dr. Pottinger, um, and cooking starchy food creates acrylamides, which is a class one carcinogen. It's amazing to me that uh, our government still even allows that. You know, why... <laughs> Why do they even recommend that we eat class one carcinogens? I, I don't know what's wrong with us. But I don't think government is concerned much about your health, though. Yeah, apparently not. Apparently not. Yeah, that's one of the things that happens, I think, when you become a raw foodist or you go on this serious health journey is that you see all of the, uh, the, the government's dropping the ball. And, and we realize we can't depend on our government. We can't depend on others for our health. We really have to take responsibility for our own health. Uh, which is um, somewhat liberating, but then you start to question everything, don't you? <laughs> yes. Oh, there's Dr. Graham. I think he's back. So one last try. Yes. yes last try. Okay. So um, desired outcomes, it's up to you to decide what you want and what the outcome should be. But now you know a little bit more, why are we eating fresh foods? because fresh is best and I deserve the best and you deserve the best. Uh, we're, we're looking at nutrition from a standpoint of food rather than trying to have to understand hundreds of thousands of nutrients and juggle them and their ratios and proportions with all the other nutrients which with they interact. Uh, and finally, you know, if you want to say the words one more time, you know, tremorogens and mutagens and carcinogens and, and tumorogens and, car, you know, God, I mean, there's just so many negative influences in food that actually for me, I'm surprised that as of yet, only a few lawyers have gotten involved. Now, enough lawyers got involved so that as probably everyone is aware, some years ago, it became illegal for places like Krispy Kreme donuts to use what were called trans fats in their cooking because of the carcinogens that are created when we heat trans fats. And I'm just shocked so far there's just not enough raw food lawyers. But when there's a few more raw food lawyers, uh, this whole concept will catch on to the point where everybody can sue everybody because they were serving carcinogens in their food. I mean, it, it'll, be a, it'll be a fest, at which point, like with many things, in the same way that smoking cigarettes has, has gone out of vogue, so will eating cooked food. You watch, folks. You either have the opportunity to be on the crest of the wave, surfing down the front of the slope, or you can be left behind uh, waiting to catch up later with the masses because raw foods is catching on. And 
you're either going to say, wow, I was doing raw foods back in, back in 2020. I was doing raw foods in 2021. I was doing raw foods back with let's cook raw, man. When that thing first got started, I was in on that. I saw, you know, and you'll, and you'll be a pioneer or, you know, you'll wait till everybody else does it, but it just depends how much health you really want and how much health accumulation you want working for you 10, 20, 30 years down the line. So look down the line a little bit and see how far down the line do you want to go. Uh, personally, I was at the, I was at the 1976 bicentennial and the firework, I love fireworks and the fireworks are spectacular at the bicentennial. And I swore on that day that I'm going to the tricentennial. So I really, I, that's my goal. I want to make the tricentennial. Hopefully you've set some goals too and put them out in front of you and then do what you need to do in order to reach those goals. Uh, I'll take a peek at chat and thank you all very much for putting up with my, my delays today. Well, thank you, Dr. Graham. That was so informative and so putting you at the edge and make you think and make you to reevaluate things, which is that's what we're here for. We don't want to move on the same um, wake up, eat this and this and expect better results. No, we want to wake up, make some changes that will help us to stay healthier. And uh, I'm grateful for everyone being here. I'm thankful to Dr. Graham doing this for us. I'd like to announce next show and then we can um, do a couple of questions. So please register for next Sunday. We're going to do raw vegan blueberry cake with our guest chef Lena Rop. Um, Lena is plant-based chef, recipe developer, food stylist, healthy living educator, and author and social media influencer uh, based on Enthesitas, um, Enthesitas, California. It became her per personal mission to inspire others to take control of your health, starting in the kitchen. Um, she's amazing. I talked to her several times. Um, all her family, her mom, two young kids, and her husband is all raw vegans, and they just adore it. They thrive on it. They, they just live that lifestyle. So um, come next Sunday to be with us for that show. And Dr. Graham, I have a question for you. Good. I'm looking through and I'm reading all the questions too. So I'll answer a couple of those as well, but let's start with you. So on, on top of those gems, you know, we know that when we eat animal cooked food, all those hormones that the fear, the sickness, the whatever they injected and grows with, we, is that a part of the gems or it's a separate kind of issue? I think that's all the fear in the world caused by us consuming those hormones with that food? Well, I mean, we've gone from plants to animals, right? So when you're eating animals, you, you're opening up a world of other problems. And, okay. and yes, the, the animal foods uh, have adrenaline and you get their adrenaline when you eat your foods. We get, uh, when, you know, when you eat bacon or whatever it is you're eating. And, and certainly, uh, being exposed to the animal hormones, not only the growth hormones that are injected into the animals, but then the fear hormones and the other, other endocrine gland hormones. Uh, yes, you get some of that. And yes, you, you feel some of that. So um, most people who eat a meat-based meal will feel empowered, they're going to feel the, the, a, a little bit of stimulation from this uh, because yes, they're getting some adrenaline and it is a stimulating factor. So uh, certainly, but none of those would be counted as, as gens, no. Okay. Does that help? Yes. Okay. Uh, so the, uh, the RDA for protein, Brian, no, it, it's different in different places. Different countries use different RDA, uh, different values. Um, most people are pretty happy to say for a man that if you're getting 50 grams a day, you're, you're doing the, you've more than done the job. No, nobody's real. I mean, unless you're just 
unless you've just lost the plot on protein, you, you're trying to be a bodybuilder, um, 50 grams for a man, two thirds of that for a lady is usually considered more than enough. Um, and in fact, you could probably, most guys, most guys, if you said, oh, I'm getting 40, nobody would be worrying that much. And if you actually do the math, you know, on a raw food diet, uh, getting 50 grams isn't that difficult. Uh, so it, it's easy enough to get what's recommended in terms of protein on a raw food diet. Uh, and yes, folks, uh, people eating a, a vegan diet, raw or otherwise, uh, people eating a vegan diet will show lower blood protein levels. That's uh, almost automatic. Uh, so you're right on there, right on there, Sarah. Um, there are, there is blood work feather that's done for, um, if you still trust them, the WHO uh, has created a, a, an entire new expected normal values, growth curves, da da da, for vegans. And so for vegan children, for vegan children, the growth curve um, and on through other things like that. So uh, we, can, we can get some of the values. And yet again, you know, the raw fooders is gonna see some other values that isn't included in the WHO. Uh, for instance, we're gonna have lower white blood cell count because we just don't need white blood cells uh, function as janitors in the body, and you just don't need so many janitors when you're eating a clean diet. So, uh, we'll, we'll, and that's not something that the WHO really accounts for because they haven't created raw vegan stats. They only created. Um, if I missed a question, tell me. If anybody else has any more, we'll do another couple minutes. And if not, I will say. I'm really looking forward to next week. Uh, it's it, thank you for putting up with the power outages. I'm going to be here for the next five weeks, but I won't. I won't be. Uh, hopefully, we're having power outages today. I just found out, by the way, um, we're having power outages because a couple of minutes before the show started, here on the property, which is several acres, but here on the property, I heard it happen. I thought, what the heck was that? That was the the biggest sound I've heard in a long time. And it turns out that it was two giant trees fell down. And not only did they tear up um, water pipes, but now they're having an impact on electricity as well. And so the power just keeps going in and out and in and out as they're trying to. It is. Yeah, it's not uh oh. <laughs> oh, there, he's still here. Okay. Brian has a question, yeah. Dr. Yes. Ben. So I, my question has to do with a term that you used moments ago, uh, which is regeneration. And, you know, I think we've all heard the story about how smokers, if they stop smoking, that within seven years, their lungs start to look uh, like maybe they never smoked. Or I, I don't remember exactly how many years it is that they have to go uh, of not smoking anymore. So, um, you know, I, too, am concerned about my eyes, you know. I don't see as well as I used to. And so why don't our eyes regenerate on the low fat raw vegan diet or, or do they? Yeah, I've seen it very often. I, I used to keep a box in my office um, at a place called Club Hygiene, which is where I did, did fasting supervision. And I would keep a box in my office that was filled with glasses from people who stopped wearing them. Um, because they found the need was no longer there. Uh, and it's a process to totally, totally get past it. Um, in the same way, Brian, that when I first went raw, um, I was already going gray and my hair color came back to brown. So there was an obvious regen a regeneration, a rejuvenation happening. Um, I noticed some changes in my eyes. Um, that were beginning in my 30s, I noticed some changes. And by the time I went low fat raw vegan, um, which I've been doing now, what, for 
but it ha- I haven't been doing low fat raw vegan for a full 40 years yet, but, but for more than, more than 30. And I noticed uh, not only my eyes improved, but again, hair improved. And, uh, so there is some, but it doesn't mean you're going to go back to square one. Uh, that would be nice. You know, you're not going to go back to a five-year-old's eyes or a two-year-old's eyes, but even if you can, uh, because what you have going on, if I was to describe it as a runaway train, right? Like the degeneration in the eyes is a runaway train. And then you switch diet and you go to raw vegan, low fat, raw vegan, whatever. And that, and what happens? The runaway train slows down. Uh, but that's almost an unnoticeable improvement, isn't it? Because you're still getting worse, just not as fast as you were. And, and we have no way to compare it because it's all an experiment of one. Um, but definitely we see the, the, because we sometimes see the degeneration stop and we sometimes see regeneration, we can be sure that it's happening all the way, you know, throughout the entire um, sample group, if you will. So, um, I well, my, my eyes actually got measurably better when I first started raw food 15 years ago, right. noticeably. And, and it uh, stayed that way for a good 10 years. And then, you know, it um, started to decline again. So is this well, just aging or? Well, sure. There, I mean, there's several things going on. Uh, and I can't speak to all of them, but certainly uh, one of them is that if, if uh, 15 years ago, yeah, you were 15 years younger than you are now. Yeah. yeah. And things worked better than they do now. Okay. I know things work really well and you're super healthy and vital and, and bless you. Um, but 15 years ago was better. You know, I mean, you were younger and you responded quicker. Uh, and for instance, this uh, presentation that I told you about you know, that I watched on vitamin D, one of the things that the doctor mentioned was that as we get older, it gets increasingly difficult to uptake vitamin D from the sun. We're just not as good at it as we used to be. And I don't know, I, I, it, it rang a bell in my head, like, oh, wait a minute, is that true? I don't know that that's true because we're getting older, per se, or if it's just getting true because the damage that was done ages zero to 20 or zero to 30 um, has had a chance to kick in a little bit longer. It's, and so that because the damage just keeps accumulating, right? It's just oh, every little ding and scratch and burr or whatever. So all of a sudden you go, oh, it's like becoming too much to cope with. So um, were you to do a supervised fast and and full on get into you know let's everything we can possibly do for you and and spot on as it were you know and then tell me that your vision didn't improve uh then we got to go well you know there's really not a lot more you can do you can do the Bates program you can do some of the vision improvement programs and drills and see if that helps a bit but uh without without the fast uh you know you're the, the concept that I taught down in Costa Rica was called bandwidth, right? Like we have bandwidth. We have a certain amount of bandwidth to keep our body running and then a certain amount of bandwidth to regenerate, to rejuvenate, to rejuvenesce um, and, and heal ourselves from various things. And, and you know, if you're, if you're running yourself ragged and you're not getting much sleep and you're working out like crazy, you don't, I mean, we... I, I met more world-class athletes in the last few years who have completely broken down their health and couldn't recover. Um, they just didn't have any more bandwidth with which to recover, with which to even maintain their health. And we're thinking, wow, they're super fit. Well, yeah, but don't, mis- don't mistake fit with healthy. Um, so when we're fasting, we increase the available bandwidth dramatically 
and and see things heal that otherwise we just didn't have the just didn't have the bandwidth to heal it and 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 we don't have to understand all that chemistry necessarily although as you said you know uh, we understand a lot and there's no need to understand everything um i have a client that i'm working with right now who is uh he said to me look you know i'm not going to give up uh, i i commended him for not giving up and he goes I'm not going to give up on solving my health problems until I've tried everything. Until I've tried everything, it would be stupid to give up. So he's, uh, you know, bless his heart. He's now trying low-fat raw vegan for the first time and, and seeing good results with low-fat raw vegan, um, which was an option that he didn't even know existed until recently and, and profoundly different from anything he'd been doing. A uh, very standard American diet, so our standard Western diet, and um, and so let me answer the eye problem after your supervised fast. Okay, <laughs> you have a deal. Okay, <laughs> or you I get actually... back to us. You get back to us and tell us how the eyes okay. improve. You know, once that happens, because I I think what you'll see, like most people see, uh, is that all. All facets of health vector towards health. All fat, all structures, all functions vector towards health when we fast, and that includes ears, eyes, nose, mouth, our sense of smell. You know, sense of touch. Everything improves. A balance, coordination, all of it improves. So, um, as well does does vision, and I would expect yours would too. It would be odd for it not to. And then we just come down to a point of. How much bandwidth is there? What does the body think are the priorities that need to be addressed? It might not be your eyes, might not be the first thing. Awesome, that's great. Thanks for spending time with me, folks. I really do appreciate it.